Hello and welcome to the Landkit Paving Workflow where we'll be learning a little bit about how to create and manipulate our own paving patterns. You'll see we have Grasshopper minimized down here in the corner and we'll be using the Paving Workflow panel here in order to manipulate the different parameters that control how we create our paving patterns. You'll also see that we have a series of layers already established here in the Rhino file. These are organized and named specifically to interact with the Grasshopper script. And so all you will have to do is add and subtract and manipulate the geometry within these layers in order to create your paving pattern. All right, well, let's dive in. So in the workflow panel here, you'll see that it starts out on the info tab, which gives us a little bit of an overview on how to utilize this workflow panel in addition to what these different layers mean and how to sort of manipulate and utilize them and the types of geometry that you might place inside of them. You'll see at the top here that we have our play pause button, which allows us to pause the entire script that's running in Grasshopper and then reactivate it by turning it on. This can be useful for if you're manipulating a lot of geometry at once and you don't want it to process every single time you move something, you can just toggle everything off, make a bunch of adjustments and then toggle it back on. All right, let's dive into the paving tab where we can select and manipulate our pattern types and our paver sizes and joint spacings and rotations and things like that. So the default is the hex grid, but you can see that just simply by selecting some of these other drop down items, we can select between various types of standardized patterns, which are seen here. Um, we can also use customized patterns and tessellations and paving along paths. And these are quite fun and handy to use. So for instance, if we wanted to go into a custom pattern, we can select that and we can look at all the different geometry that we're using to generate our custom pattern. So it utilizes closed curves here in order to cut out the pavers. So if we have a specific set of geometry that we just wanna utilize, we can. Now, if we want something that's very highly customized, but repeating across the whole site, um, we can go to the tessellation option, which requires a little bit more understanding of how these little pieces come together. But you can see that by aligning a series of closed curves and then placing these different spots around, which indicate our starting point, our unit start, our U offset and our V offset for how you create the tessellation here. So it's going to copy the pattern from this point to this point and then from this point to this point and repeat that across in a sort of three by three grid to show you an example of what your pattern looks like here. But then once we have that sort of figured out, you can see it tessellating across the whole site here. One thing that's important to note about the tessellation pattern is that you don't select a seam to be placed inside of this pattern. It, you have to automatically generate the seam yourself using the pattern. Um, and the way it tessellates. So it's just something to keep in mind if you're using the tessellation pattern and also the custom pattern does not automatically create a seam or joint spacing. Now, if we jump into the last one here, which is pave along path, you can see that we have a way of generating a pattern that follows a curve here. You can also notice that we actually have a path width that we can control. So if I increase this up to 12, it's going to make the width of that path 12 and again, continuously follow a curve that we've generated. So it's a great way of getting those pavers to sort of follow along this path that you're trying to generate. Now, you can see also that we have a couple of options here available to us for the patterns for pave along paths. So if we wanted you know, a grid pattern, something that's a little bit more of a grid, or if we want something that's a little bit more sort of random uh, mix, we can do that as well. So let's jump back over to the running bond pattern again really quick and let's talk about some of these options that we have available to us. We have our paver lengths and widths. These are set in inches. So if I wanted my pavers to be a little bit uh, longer, I could simply increase that value and you can see that now my pavers have increased in their length. We also have joint spacing, which allows us to change the spacing between the pavers. So if we need a little bit more of a gap, we can just simply add that and it will automatically update that and change the pattern for us. And then we have things like pattern steps, which um, you know, if you see the tool tip, it really only works with herring bond, herring bone and, um, and running bond pattern, but it allows us to sort of offset these pavers a little bit so that they're not perfectly the seam of the, um, 
of the next row is not meeting directly in the middle. You can offset that to meet on the one third mark or the two third marks and so on and so forth. And then the last thing we have here is the ability to rotate our entire pattern within our paving area. So if we want it to be oriented a specific direction, this is an easy way to do that. All right, let's talk about the color tab now and all the ways that you can manipulate the way that the colors are applied to your pavers. These are done th so using what's called a color rule. And so we have a drop down for a couple different ways that the color rules can be applied to our paving pattern. The first one that we're going to talk about is the attractor's color rule, which allows us to place geometry inside of the attractor's layer. And anything inside of there is going to create sort of a way of adhering the colors to that specific geometry. So if I move this around, you can see that the white pavers are closest to that geometry and then it creates a gradient away to the darker colors from that. This works with curves, spots, surfaces, meshes. You can place and um, take away geometry from these layers in order to create new gradients, but it's really uh, within your control. And then in addition to that, you have these settings that allow you to adjust how this gradient is being created. So for instance, the minimum distance is going to adjust the distance of the innermost color and how far that is uh, creating a gradient away from your pattern. So if I increase this to three, you can see that it's going to generate a lot more of the white paver and create a tighter gradient further away. But if I decrease this back down to one and then I reset the maximum distance down to three per se, then you can see it's going to tighten up that gradient and decrease the reach of the final gradient color. So the ability to see a little bit of uniqueness and randomness to the gradient while also having a little bit of control over how that gradient is being represented is something that is very useful and applies across to a lot of the others as well. So the exception being the random, which simply takes the different colors that you've selected and just randomly applies them to pavers across. We also have the gradient, which allows us to use a gradient curve. So you can see here that we have this curve from one end to the other. It's going to create a gradient. So if I tighten up this curve and make it smaller, you can see it's going to adhere to the reach of that specific curve. So if I make it even smaller, you'll see that we have a lot of dark, dark, gray, lighter gray, lightest gray, white. And so it's going to allow us to put in any type of curve and have it create a gradient across that entire guide curve. And you can see here too that we still have some of those attractor minimum and maximum distances that we can control. And then the last of these uh, patterns is the image pattern, which allows us to insert an image. So a surface with an image applied to it or a picture uh, using the picture command in Rhino um, is the tool that you would use to apply an image um, onto a surface automatically. And then when you place it in this layer, what it's gonna do is it's gonna read the different color variations in that image and then apply the colors that you have here to those color variations to sort of mimic this pattern across your site. Another nice thing about this is the ability to control what colors we're using. So if I don't like the white and I want this to be sort of a yellowish beige color, I can make it that. And if we switch it back to the gradient, you'll be able to see that here where the white was. But we can also do advanced and create our own custom colors using the hex key or the RGB values and just apply specific colors that we want to each of these categories. Additionally, we can control the number of colors that are being represented here from three all the way up to, I believe, nine different colors here. So you can see it's creating this gradient of nine different colors across. All right, so let's talk about the documentation tab or the doc tab, where we can utilize a tool called the rationalize paving tool. So when we toggle this on, you'll see that our pattern changes a little bit, but more importantly, we get this grid that has percentages inside of them. And this tool was created to make the communication with your contractor for installation a little bit easier and more efficient so that you can indicate a location where this grid begins and then lay out all of your paving cells that you're using for installation into a nice even grid that a contractor can follow with percentages of each color paving type inside of each of those cells so that a, a contractor or installer could break down the pavers into uh, percentages for each of these cells and then install them using the original image that you've produced of your actual paving pattern. Now you'll notice that this kind of breaks apart the paving pattern a little bit because it's simply 
taking those percentages and just mixing them at random inside of each cell. So it's not actually building the pattern exactly how you have it originally, but um, it's a cool tool for creating that communication between a contractor and also potentially even generating new types of patterns using layers of different um, pattern types on top of your original pattern. So you could break this down to a running bond and create these really unique and interesting variations of your pattern uh, by changing around your pattern type or even changing around your grid size. So if you wanted this to be, you know, quote unquote, a paver size of five feet by five feet, you could break it down into smaller cells to get a closer representation of your pattern or uh, make your pattern a little bit more accurate for installing and things like that. You can also decrease the denominator percentage values so that you can get exact, more exact percentage values such as 59, 37, 34, as opposed to more generalized um, percentages if you increase the denominator to 10, so you end up with a 70, 30, um, and 0, 0. All right, so let's talk about the output tab or the out tab, where we can see all the different output options that we have available for our paving pattern. The first is a drop down menu, which allows us to select our outputs as either curves or meshes or hatches. These outputs are geared towards the different types of drawings or diagrams that you might be making, as well as meshes, which can be used for applying textures to for rendering. The other option here is a toggle for allowing you to toggle on and off whether or not your pavers are trimmed to your paving area. Um, additionally, you can also project your pavers to a topography. So if you have a piece of topo directly above your paving area, we can change that shape however we want and then apply the project to pavers option and see all of our pavers project up to the topography that we're actually generating or a topography that we just have placed inside of this layer. And then the last option that we have available to us is what's called random texture mapping. This allows us to take a texture and apply it to each paver individually, the same texture, and what it does is the random texture mapping will automatically apply a unique scale and rotational factor for each of the pavers so that when you apply a single texture to all of the pavers, the texture will look a little bit different from paver to paver so that you don't get that repetitive look across your whole paving area. So you can see how all the pavers look like they have a unique texture, but that's just because of the random texture mapping that is being generated. So you can pick a texture to apply for previewing, but when you bake these out into your Rhino file with this toggle on, you'll have to apply texture to that layer in order to see that random texture mapping being applied. So very useful for the rendering um, process if you're not using software that automatically does this for you. The last step of the process is utilizing the bake pavers button. So once we have a texture and color scheme and paving pattern that we like, we can hit bake pavers and you'll see that it actually generates a layer for us called paving with our pavers separated out into individual layers based on their colors. So we can actually see these different um, types of colors in each of their own individual layers, which can make it easy for counting these different pavers or applying different textures to their layers and so on and so forth. All right, thank you for joining this tutorial on how to use the LandKit paving workflow. If you are interested in learning more about LandKit, please visit our website at landkit.design and explore all the range of educational materials that are available on the website. Additionally, if you're running into bugs or issues, um, check out our office hours where you can get free help on a Zoom call uh, at any of our available times during the week.